Welcome to Marrow Masters Season 5, sponsored by the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, CGEN, Omeros Corporation, and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. The National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, established in 1992, strives to help patients, caregivers, and their families cope with the psychosocial challenges of transplant from diagnosis through survivorship. Here's your host, Executive Director of the NBMT Link, Peggy Burkhardt. Welcome, everyone. This series focuses on survivorship. Whether you're five minutes or 25 years plus into your survivorship, we've got it all for you today. We've got perspectives that will speak to you, inspire you, and help you at every turn. When patients enter survivorship, it's truly a gift, but it also can be overwhelming at times and emotionally draining. This season will focus on helping survivors and caregivers better understand the despair, mental challenges, work career issues, GVHD, and the role it plays in survivorship, giving back, not giving up, finding your herd, and so much more. So grab a few minutes, grab some coffee, settle in, and get ready to be enlightened and educated as you make a few new friends along the way, friends that will share their grit, intense honesty, and determination to not only get through this, but to show you how to thrive and live your best life. Today, we welcome Anna Holness of New York. Anna received her life-saving bone marrow transplant for MDS in October of 2017. A physician herself, Anna, equipped with a healthcare background, tackled her transplant accordingly, educating herself while getting prepared and armed to wage war against this enemy. Anna, a mom, wife, and innate caregiver to so many, will share not only her best advice today, but will warm your heart with her giving spirit. She's always there for everyone else with a smile on her face and a terrific attitude. Anna became a friend as I got to know her, so compassionate and so kind. A regular participant of our programs, I've always admired her thirst for knowledge. I learned from her. Today, we're all the lucky ones to learn from Anna as she shares her story and her spirit. And GVHD has also been a part of Anna's journey, and today she will tell us more about that as well. Welcome, Anna. I'm so happy to have you here today. Let's start with what exactly happened, how you processed your diagnosis, and how you prepared for transplant. How did you accomplish feeling armed and ready to take this on? Hi, Peggy. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, and I'm so honored to be sharing my story today with my fellow patients, people that are considering a transplant, others who have already had their transplants, their families and caregivers. I really feel like we're all in this together and that we all can learn from each other and help each other and support each other in so many ways. As you said, I had a transplant in October of 2017. I had been diagnosed in February of 2017. When I was diagnosed, I felt like I needed knowledge. I needed medical knowledge. I needed scientific knowledge. And I knew that I wanted, I was going to need emotional support. What I wanted for my children, and I, that was my main concern, was I felt like I wanted to lessen the burden on them. I wanted to sort of take out the pain um, if I were to die. I knew that while I was alive, we would all make it through together. It would be very difficult. I'm sorry, I'm just getting upset here. No problem. Um, I felt like it would be difficult, but while I was alive, we would all get through this together. It was if I died, if things didn't turn out the way we all wanted them, that's when I thought that they would be needing the most. And I wanted to lessen that part of it. And I thought, okay, how am I going to do that for them? And it may sound morbid to discuss, oh, what if I die? What if I don't make it through this? But I always have felt that forewarned is forearmed. You hope for the best, but you're realistic about things. You're positive, but again, realizing that things could go wrong. And I knew that this was a disease. This was, I had to, I needed a transplant. 
I couldn't take away the pain of my diagnosis for my children, but maybe I could lessen the pain if things weren't going to turn out how we all hoped. To me, I felt like I could do that by being honest with them, by telling them the truth, again, remaining positive and hopeful, but being a realist. And for them knowing that they were going to be here for each other, that my husband, their father was going to be here for them. But in the meantime, you know, that it would be rough. I said, okay, so what am I going to do? It just came down to these practical matters. I said, I need to leave them their birth certificates, passports. I need to tell them where everything is, what is important, what operations they've had in the past and why these things. And I guess my medical background made me think of that stuff that I had to like make sure they knew. For my daughter, we have a very strong history of breast cancer. And so I needed to leave those documents and those medical facts for her. And then one thing that I did that turned out to be the most important thing was, you know, we all keep items for our children that we save for them, whether it is a doll, a dress. I remember my daughter has this beautiful dress that she, you know, wore for a, a birthday party and she had face paint on and I always remember that dress and it makes me happy to look at that picture when she had the dress on. And I thought, you know, we save all these things, but sometimes they don't mean as much to the people that we leave them to. And so I went to the place in the attic where I have stored all these things for my kids. Again, a dress, my son's favorite sweater that he wore until the sleeves were up to his <laughs> elbows and, you know, some toys that they had. And I wrote down, I took all these pink post-its and I just wrote down a couple of words, a sentence, or attached a photo of them wearing that article of clothing, or you wore the sweater until it was, <laughs> the sleeves were up to your elbows. And I just feel like that way I could tell them why it was special to me. In many cases, why it was special to them, because as a child, they might not necessarily remember. I love that, Anna. I think that's really neat. And to this day, I'm so glad that I did that. And that's one thing that I didn't tell them about. I wanted them to discover that, and they will discover that one day when I'm not here. Other things that I did, and these were, again, more practical, not as emotional as the thing with the clothes, was I got a big notebook, and you could tell my age by me saying that I have a notebook <laughs> and not that I went to my laptop, but <laughs> I got my big college rule, five-subject notebook, and I started writing down every single password that I could remember down to those kooky ones that no one ever knows, like what was your first car? What was the first <laughs> school you went to? What was the name of your first best friend? You know, and then I went on and then I wrote down, okay, if you need advice on this, you know, you call this friend. And I left all that contact information. If you need advice on whatever, on traveling, you go to this friend. And I even wrote on some friends, I wrote, okay, you can call this person and ask her for advice. But remember, she's a little kooky and, <laughs> and she might, she, you know, take her advice with a grain of salt. And so in preparing, it wasn't always morbid. And my friends, some of them would say, why are you doing all this? You should be going away on vacation. But that's not what would make me feel better. What would make me feel better was to leave my kids with this feeling that when I went into the hospital, I could go in and concentrate on just getting better, dealing with the side effects, because I knew that I had left them as prepared as possible. I wanted to empower them, strengthen them. 
I can't even put it any other way than to lessen their burden, you know, when I wasn't here. Another thing I did, which my friends really criticized me for, but again, it turned out to be fantastic for my family. I spoke to them about what I wanted for my funeral. And it started out with me saying, look, I don't want anything. Just cremate me and you can put the ashes in the Long Island Sound because you know I like the water. And then Aaliyah, my daughter, started saying, but what about your friends? Aren't they want to come to the service and mass and all this? And I said, do whatever you want to do. Do whatever makes you feel good. This is all going to be about you guys, not about me. And don't all these dinners, people have dinners and everyone comes to your house and you're mourning and you have to be serving people. And my daughter said, well, we're just going to serve them Diet Pepsi and gummy bears because that's what you like. And I said, that's <laughs> fine if that's what you want to do. And then what was going to be a very sad, depressing subject, discussing funeral arrangements became something that to this day we joke about. And, you know, I don't even know who it was, Evan or Aaliyah, that said, this is not going to be a funeral. This is going to be a roast. <laughs> and, and now, every, you know, if I do something quirky or, or whatever, they'll say to me, oh, that's going to go in the roast too, mom. That's another one for the roast, mom. <laughs> and now we laugh about it. And we can laugh about it, thankfully, because I'm still here. But you know what? I think that even if I wasn't here, at least it would make them smile that we were able to joke about it at that time, it took the pressure off. It sort of lightened it. It wasn't an oppressive thing. We had this conversation when I was feeling fine, when we were all at home. We didn't have it while I was in a hospital bed. And we had the conversation. We had the conversation as opposed to me leaving them with that extra burden when I was gone. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to give them the ability to focus on what they wanted to focus on emotionally, as opposed to dealing with the logistics of a funeral, of passwords, of where do I look for this record of mine? Where's my birth certificate when I want to get married? Where's my birth certificate? Where's my communion um, certificate? All these things that we don't think of because that's what parents do, right? We keep all these records, but when we're not there, then what What do you do? It's, it's sort of reminded me of like, they always say the woman, but this could be the man also, um, a woman whose husband dies and then she doesn't know where the checkbook is. Yes. I wanted my kids to know where the checkbook was, you know, <laughs> and, and not only where it was, but how to complete it, how to, how to do everything. And so that's how I prepared. And, and you know what? Preparing them made me feel better. It really did. It sort of was part of my preparation. It made me feel at ease and of course, I was thinking about them when I was in the hospital and in the residence recuperating, but I could almost say that I just could walk into the hospital and not look back. Okay, Anna, that's, you know what, I love this because I don't think we've covered this very much. I know, it's a kind of morbid, I know, Leah. <laughs> I think it's important. And I think as a parent myself, I can totally relate to this. I don't know that most people would be so unselfish as you were, but I'm processing everything you're saying and I'm thinking about it. I probably would have done about half of what you did <laughs> on a good day, maybe. Well. And I just, knowing you and knowing your heart, this doesn't surprise me at all. And I'm, I'm kind of giggling to the whole idea of Murphy's Law because you took the time to do all of this. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, this is so wonderful. You're, you're alive <laughs> and well, and it wasn't needed. So you prepared for the worst and you hoped for the best, and you got the best, thank God. Thank you for sharing that. So let's talk more about, you got through the transplant, it's been a few years now. Let's talk about how it is for your kids today. You know, fast forward, and, and how old are Leah and Evan? So Evan was 23, and Leah was 21 when I was diagnosed. 
And now three and a half years later, they are both out of college. They're in a good place. I think that, you know, of course you hear people say, oh, you know, we've gained so much from the experience, but, you know, they knew that I always had their back, that I was going to be there for them no matter what. And I knew that about them. But now it's out in the open. It's a more tangible thing. We are, um, is it possible to say we're closer? Sure. It's almost a tangible thing. It's We have this bond. Sometimes I look at my phone. I'm like, oh, my goodness, we've been talking to each other, texting and calling all day long. And, you know, I asked them, what do they feel now? And my son said, you know, I felt like Aaliyah and I could handle anything. I felt like we were okay. Of course, we were upset that you were diagnosed, but we I felt like we could handle anything. Just a couple of months ago, Evan said that he had told his friend who had had um, a death in the family, his his brother had died in his 30s. And he said to him, you know, you should speak to your parents and, you know, maybe they want to discuss certain issues with you about their funeral, but they don't want you to be in pain. So maybe if you bring it up, it'll be better. And he was telling them about what the experience was that we had and how it was better because he felt like, okay, now I don't have to be guessing what mom wanted. I can do exactly what she wanted. Oh, my sister and I are on the same track together. He felt prepared. That was the word he used. He felt prepared. You know, and I thought, you know what? This is a life's lesson that by me, just telling him it wouldn't have had the same meaning as him having lived through it. Think of the maturity he had at his young age because of your experience. I love that, the feeling prepared notion. Yes. He told me this at one time, and my daughter just last week said, Mom, I have this plan at work, and you know what? I have a plan if the plan doesn't work. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, I've taught them like to plan. <laughs> and then and then she said to me, yeah, because you always have to have a plan because your plan may not go as planned. So you have to have another way to rework that. Well, she sounds like a chip off the old block. <laughs> and I was just so happy to hear her to say that. You know, you know, you feel good when you feel like you've prepared your children. Yes. Right? You feel like we all spend our lives hoping that they have a good moral compass, that they're compassionate, that they know the value of education. But those are things that come along, you know, along the life as they live with us. But then when it actually comes and you see it in action, then you sort of like breathe a sigh of relief, you know? Sure. We had a tough journey, but there's definitely a lot of good that came out of it. Okay. Well, let's let's move on a little bit about how you are one of the people I think of that just always has this thirst for learning and you share what you learn and you're so knowledgeable. So post-transplant, life today, what can you tell somebody that maybe is about to get a transplant? You know, other parts of the journey, what's your best advice, which you wish you knew then that you know now? My best advice, yes. I would say find your sources of emotional support. For me, it was actually organizations like the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link I contacted you and <laughs> I, I needed, you know, I had read, oh, I can get a peer to peer. I can speak to someone that has MDS. And, you know, I was asked like, well, okay, does it have to be a woman? And I said, no, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, but maybe someone that's in the healthcare field, because then I knew that we would speak on that level. It turned out to be the best thing. And I recommend that everyone even if you've already had your transplant, speak to someone who's had a transplant. Because although all of our experiences are different, 
we all can learn from each other. The person that was my peer support, I am friends with her to this day. I spoke to her today. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize that. Yes. Awesome. She, <laughs> you would think we don't have anything in common. I live in the Northeast, you know, just on the outskirts of New York City. She lives on a farm in North Carolina with horses and cows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. And yet, I don't know. It's like I, I asked her, you know, what was your transplant like? She was lucky enough that she had a donor. I did not. I had a haplocord stem cell transplant, which meant that I had my transplant from a fetal cord. And actually, it was Evan, my son, that was the other donor. And she told me, you know, what to watch for in the hospital and the side effects of the medication and, you know, the vomiting and the diarrhea. And don't be afraid when you're confused because, you know, it can happen to you. And all this information that, yes, my medical team, my physicians, I could read about it, but knowing and hearing about it from a patient is invaluable. And Carolyn and I have become friends. And in fact, if I could share with you that she, oh God, I'm getting choked up, that she um, unfortunately had to have a second transplant and she had her second transplant on my birthday. Really? Oh. And, um, <laughs> wow. And so we'll, we'll never forget that. I certainly will never forget that. And she's doing well now, you know. Oh, that's great news. And she was telling me, because she didn't have radiation the first time, and I did. And she said, I was listening to my doctor tell me about radiation. And I knew that I had to call you because I knew that you had had radiation during your transplant. So I would say the peer support... I would say, listen to webinars, podcasts, just find other people that have gone through this because that is invaluable. That is something that you can lean on. It's so true. It's sort of different when a doctor tells you something and I'm a physician, but I can tell you that it's very different when, and as much as I looked for medical and scientific knowledge and, and I was reading on my medical publications and online, the support groups are something that I think everyone needs. And even to this day, well, now, you know, if you have graft versus host disease, and I, I do have some issues with graft versus host disease with my skin and my eyes. And Peggy, if you remember, that's how, that's how we first met. On a, um... <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a support group that had to do with graft versus host disease that the link was offering. You know, we kept in touch. The people from that group kept in touch for a few months after that. Oh, great. And even practical stuff like get your wig before you go in for your transplant. You know, all these little things. How did I find these out? I found these things out by reading by speaking to people, because you don't know what you don't know. So I did a lot of reading and talking to people. Oh, this is great, Anna. Is there anything else you want to add as we close out here? I would say slow down. I, I think that I, in life, always was in a rush to do things and always looking ahead the next step. But transplant has taught me to slow down. And I have a deeper appreciation now for time, for spending time just doing nothing, like looking at nature. I remember I said to my friend, oh, you know, it's such a beautiful spring. There's so much greenery and the trees and the <laughs> flowers. And she said to me, Anna, it's always been like this. You just haven't had time to look. You now it's the your home after your transplant and you're looking at this, you know. Yeah. And she was so right. She was so right. In fact, I remember in the fall, I said, Wow, the leaves, they're beautiful. And she said, Anna, we already had this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so I just 
would say to just, and I think maybe it comes naturally. Maybe once you go through something life-changing, like a transplant, like being diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome or some sort of cancer, you have a different perspective on things and you appreciate things. You appreciate time. You appreciate nature. You appreciate your friends, your family. And we all say that, but maybe you just feel it more intensely. And Peggy, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to share this, my experience. But one thing I do want to add is that, you know, this is what worked for me, for my family, but everyone is different. All of our experiences make us the people that we are. And while I wanted all the facts, I wanted to know everything. Sometimes what's good for me and my approach may not be good for my son or my daughter or my husband. I would say, think of what makes you feel better. What will make you feel better? What will make this journey easier for you? What would make it easier for your family and Every member in your family may be different. And that's the best way for you. That's the best way for you. This is going to help so many people. It's just a wonderful perspective. And I so appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us about all of this. Thank you, Peggy. You have been a great friend. And the link helps so many people that um, when I meet people, I refer them to the National Bone Marrow Transplant link. The National Bone Marrow Transplant link is invaluable with the webinars, the podcasts. I still, I'm three and a half years out and I, I do the lunch and learns and I'm always looking to see the one on meditation. And speaking of meditation, there are things that have helped me and that weren't medical or scientific. I did yoga. I never thought I was not a pretzel person. I'm still not a pretzel person, but there's yoga for cancer. It's called Y for C. And I recommend that to everyone to just even look into it. You can even do it now. And with COVID, they have so many programs that you can do with yoga, or meditation, or Reiki, just things that sort of calm you and just take you away from, you know, what you may be feeling, like feeling nauseous or upset stomach, or just even thinking about graft versus host disease or, or infections or COVID or, you know, whatever is negative things. Thank you again. This is terrific. And we'll have some, uh, some of these links. Uh, we'll talk about the yoga in the show notes so that people can check it out and see if it's in their region. I know you had told me about that before. So thank you, Anna, for sharing so much. And uh, we sure appreciate you. Thanks again, Peggy. This has been the Marrow Masters podcast. Feel free to share this episode via text, email, or social media. For more, follow Marrow Masters in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And to connect with the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, visit nbmtlink.org or follow the link in our show notes.